Okay, so this is going to be our special bonus lecture. Well, it's not a bonus lecture, it's our makeup lecture. As you've noticed, I am, had some things I had to move around, so we will be watching this movie, and it will be a shortened lecture. That's the best way to say it. So we're sort of shortening up today. That's okay. And um, we only have to cut 15 minutes off next week, I believe, so it'll be a little more normal. But uh, I think we'll be okay doing this. So anyway, I'm just going to go right into it. Um, last time we talked about torque, and we, you know, we extended our discussion of rotating variables. And we saw that torque, if we go here, we saw that torque was sort of related equivalent rotational equivalent of force, right? But unlike force, which we had operating uh, on a dot or a point, torques are due to forces that act at different points on a body, right? So we can see if this was fixed, each of these torques would cause this square to rotate counterclockwise, okay? Now, we did some checkpoints and stuff, but we want to expand this definition that we saw. Um, you'll notice that up here, if you, it's equal to R cross F. That is the real definition of torque, and we'll see this in chapter 11, but we won't, uh, and I alluded to this last week, but you'll notice that you're looking at the um, magnitude of that cross product right here, and that the torque is equal to that R F sine theta. Uh, I went over these terms last time of line of action and moment arm. I'm not going to go over them again. You can look at the video. I'm not going to go over them again because I don't really use them. Uh, they're more, but you will use them often in your engineering. They're things, terms you find more, more commonly in your engineering. Um, so we went through the checkpoint and ended talking about Newton's second law for rotation. So we can sort of see where this is going, right? If we have... Get this straight. Let me see if I can get this straight. If we have that torque, right, is related to force, and m is not equal to, sorry, related to the moment of inertia, and acceleration. Oh, I missed. I missed, I messed this up. Anyway, let's cross that one out. And let's say if A is goes to alpha and the force goes to torque, it might be tempting, right, looking at our translational equate second law, F equals MA, to just write, oh, well, if that's true, then the torque is just going to equal the rotational equivalent mass and the rotational equivalent acceleration. And this is actually correct, all right? Torque is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. Uh, and you can do that. That's the power of looking at these analogous quantities. And you'll notice, and what I want, what I want to point out to you is that the structure of the argument is exactly the same, which is why it looks the same, which is why these, analog the, these analogies work. What I mean by that is, even though we have these different quantities, I and alpha and M and A, we're still using our basic ideas, our basic definitions of uh, uh, position, velocity, and acceleration, right? And then as we use those to develop force and, and inertia, and when we use those to develop force, we're using the same thought process to develop torque, I and alpha. It's just for a different motion. And so we're differentiating between the two motions. This is going to become critically important in Chapter 11. Okay, so... Um, you'll notice here that you, you can see a picture that's a little more, um, I'm just trying to get my inking back, but Microsoft is, Microsoft is being a douche. Um, so you'll notice here we have a point, right? You can see this point here. So one nice thing about this is you can see my cursor and pen at the same time. So you'll notice that you have a rotational axis. Um, it's, uh, I'm going 
going to need to extend this down here. Move this up. Can't do all those options. No, 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 no. No, that's bad. All right. Um, what I want you to see is that this is the axis of rotation here. That was uh, out of the uh, last slide. And you'll notice you have your position, your torque, has to be given relative to a rotation axis. We stated that last time, but that can't be emphasized enough. All right? And you'll notice you have this random M and this force here. Now I want to point some stuff out. You'll notice that you have a tangential component and a radial component. Now if you use that definition I gave you, some of this is just easier to see, right? If you look at the torque as R cross F. Right? Then we can see right away that the tangent, tangential force, will add completely to that torque. And just so you look at that, the magnitude of the torque. magnitudes, sine of the angle between them. So you'll notice the radial part, phi is zero here, right? Which in phi sine phi is equal to zero. And for the tangential force, phi equals 90 degrees, or pi over two would be a better way to look at it. And we can see that, um, we can see that sine phi will be equal to one. Okay? So we can also get the net torque, but just like we, we can add the individual torques that act on a body, we can then look at um, the net torque and set it equal to I alpha. Just like in Newton's law, we could set the net force equal to MA. All right? So now we have a checkpoint here which we'll talk about. So let's look at this. So the figure shows an overhead view of a meter stick that can pivot about the point indicated, which is uh, the left of the stick's midpoint. Uh, two forces, F1 and F2, are applied to the stick. All right, I see F1, I don't see F2. Only F1, oh, only F1 is shown. Force two is perpendicular to the stick and is applied at the right end of the stick. If the stick is not to turn, what should be the direction uh, of F2? And should it be greater than or less than or equal to F1? Okay, well, let's take a look at this. Normally, I'd have you pause and look at it, but we're a little short on time. So we'll just have a look and uh, go through. So we know... So we have two options. Let's look at them both. This could be F2, or this could be F2. All right. Actually, I'm going to erase that and choose a different color. So that way I can refer to them by their colors. Let's go with red. So these are our two possibilities, right? We don't know which one is correct yet. So it's asking us um, what should be the direction, and we want that force is a, if the stick is not to turn. Okay, so let's look at the top. If we look at this top version, you'll notice that this will, this we have this fixed pivot point. If you push on F with F2, the black one, you'll notice it'll start to rotate counterclockwise. You'll notice F1 also tends to cause a counterclockwise rotation. That means that F1 and F2, or the black F2, pointing up, complement each other, and it's always going to add to that direction. All right? So there's no value here in which this doesn't cause a faster rotation. So we can cross out this one, and by process of elimination, this must be the only, um, this must be the, tr the correct answer. But I don't like that that justification because that is not physical, and you won't always be able to do that. 
So let's understand what motions are happening. You'll notice that F1 causes a clockwise rotation, and in order to counteract a counter or, or F F1 causes a uh, counterclockwise rotation, and in order to counteract a counterclockwise rotation, you need a clockwise rotation. All right. If you're having a trouble, hard time seeing that, imagine something is spinning counterclockwise. So your goal is to slow it down. You don't spin it faster counterclockwise. You'll just keep moving faster and faster and faster. You have to apply something clockwise to oppose that rotation, and that will slow it down. Okay. So in order for these two to cancel, you have to have um, you have to have F two pointing down at the very least. All right. Um, and now we want to know should it be um, we need we need to know should it be uh, uh, greater than equal to or less than F one. Well, if it were right here, right. F2 were at this point here, uh, F1 would equal F2. This is the case for when they're equal because we can see that um, R1 equals R2, and then we know that the torque is equal to FR sine phi. But we already know this will be 1 here, right? So we can look at that. So all we have to do is look at how F, F and R changes. So now, at this point, R is equal to R1 is equal to R2. So that means F1 will equal to F2. So we know we can get rid of equal because F2 is, in fact, not here, right? F2 is applied at the right end of the stick, so right here. So this means that R is increasing. In order to create the same torque for a bigger R requires less, less force. So F2 needs to be uh, F2 needs to be less than F1. All right, let's see if we got it. If not, and F2 should be have a smaller magnitude than F1. So yay, so we're right. Okay? And again, you can you, all you have to do is argue from the equations that I looked for there before. All right. So the next thing I wanted to do was talk about briefly talk about energy and the work energy theorem. All right. So you'll notice we have um, if again we do the um, I think we've already seen this right. For kinetic energy, translationally, it equals one half mv squared. And we already saw this when we talked about the moment of inertia, right? That's translational. Translation. And we have uh, Ke one half i omega squared. That is rotational. Okay, and if you look here, let's move this stuff down. If you look here, we can see that delta K, right? If we're looking rotationally, we'll have a familiar definition. Right? So we're just looking at the delta K term, and you'll notice now it's rotational. And again, the work energy theorem, the two sides of the equation remain the same. So the work done in a rotation about a fixed axis will again, instead of being uh, F dot ds, will be T d theta. And, uh, and if we have a constant torque, we can reduce the integral to our constant, um, you know, our, our term for constant work, okay? And we can also see that we can get rotational power, all right? So that sort of wraps up this chapter, and it wraps it up with a full summary 
of pure translation versus pure rotation. So I want you to notice that we took the whole semester to cover all and introduce all of these concepts with, um, with translation. But we only took one chapter to do the same thing with rotation. Okay, so we're applying all the concepts we learned this semester into one chapter looking at a new motion. This will be a theme for the rest of the semester. All right. So uh, you'll notice that power has the same, uh, we, you, you know, if you, in case you forgot, F can be shown to be equal to, um, uh, well, power, sorry. It is nice to have an eraser. <laughs> Uh, I'll give it. I'll give Microsoft that doing it this way. But you recall that power equals f dot v, and all we're doing is saying that rotational power. We can go from force to torque, right? Force to torque, v to omega, and we get rotational power. Okay. So you'll notice we have this um, set of relatable quantities, corresponding quantities for translational and rotational motion, all right? And I want to go out on this chapter by going over what I, I would think of as a, a very interesting homework problem. And I'll tell you why I like it. I like it because it requires us, let's see if we can get it centered here, it requires us to uh, revisit some assumptions we had earlier in the semester. So earlier in the semester, when we looked at a problem like this, we could say right off the bat that T1 was equal to T2, but we'd had an assumption there. We would assume that the pulley was massless and frictionless. That is no longer the case here. We now need to look at the effects of the pulley or the disc that this rope is tied to, and you'll notice we're going to have to find T2 and T1. Now, the way I would ask this question is, uh, are T1 and T2 equal, greater than, or less than each other? You know, find the relationship between them and justify it. Okay? So, let's read the problem, and you'll notice there's E parts, so we're going to want to build them up constructively. And I'm even going to put in a new slide so that we can, uh, we can go back and forth if we need a blank one. This is a nice, this is a nice option. Right? Just add more workspace. Um, so <coughs> let's take a look. So we have here in this figure, um, we have here in this figure block M1, right, which is right there, has a mass of 460 grams. Block 2 has a mass of 500 grams. And the pulley, which is mounted on a horizontal axis with negligible friction, has a radius of five centimeters. All right, so when released from rest, the block falls 75 centimeters in five seconds without the cord slipping on the pulley. So we wanna know what is the magnitude of the acceleration of the blocks? What are the tension, T1 and T2? And what is the magnitude of the pulley's angular acceleration? What is its rotational inertia? All right, so we have a lot of stuff going on here and we can't ignore, we have a frictionless pulley, that's good, but we do not have a massless pulley. So we're gonna have to figure out properties, um, a lot of these properties here. And this is kind of a busy problem, all right? But the first thing we wanna know, it's, it's probably best to just break it up into chunks. So we wanna know what is the magnitude of the acceleration of the blocks. So one thing to keep in mind here is that they have to accelerate the same to maintain tension, right? We're gonna, we'll find very interestingly here that the tensions won't be the same, uh, and I'll show you that. But again, if they're accelerating at different rates, there is no tension in the string, right? That's a physical constraint. So we can pick one block, Right, and we know that it falls block two, you know, for, for part A, rather. We have delta T. 
equals 5 seconds. And we know that delta y equals 75 centimeters. Okay, so looking at this, the block has fallen. So when the block is falling, we have information just about its motion, right? We know how far it went and how fast it got there. So when we look at this, knowing that I have t, I'm probably going to start with delta y equals t naught yt plus 1 half ay t squared. Now it's been a while, and you may be tempted to just say, well, wait a minute, isn't ay just g? No, you have to figure that out. It's falling under tension. So we'll know it'll have some acceleration and that that acceleration will be constant uh, based on the way the problem's set up. But we don't know what that acceleration is. So that's the first thing we have to solve for. All right, you'll notice you, it's kind of tempting to, when you see this, to just put in G and saying, oh, well, it's just falling. Remember, it's subject to gravity and a tension force, okay? However, we don't need to analyze the forces yet to get the acceleration. If we needed to do that, that could be weird because now we have unknown, you know, two unknown tensions. You might be thinking, well, only one unknown tension, but we're going to see that that's not the case. So it says here, when released from rest, there's one part. So that release from rest means this is zero. And we can see here that delta y squared, and we can solve for A, doing some algebra, all right, and when you plug in numbers, you should get here that A I was just realizing I could have done this better. Not the problem, I mean setting up the, uh, I could have just copied and pasted and we could have kept going with B, C, and D. Uh, that's okay. So if you plug in numbers, A is going to equal um, let's see, plug everything in, calculate it out, and you'll get 6 times 10 to the minus 2. meters per second okay so we'll need to know that and we know we know we now know that in order in addition to delta t and delta y we now have a now you'll notice I'm actually just going to erase so that's part a so take I'll give you 10 seconds to sort of look at it all we used is kinematics right and we use the fact that it started from rest which I just deleted there um, to solve for the acceleration. And again, the accelerations must be constant because the, um, the blocks, the, the tension has to be maintained, right? So they're under tensions, they'll have two different tensions, but in order for tension to exist, the accelerations have to be the same. So hopefully you saw that with A, but now what I wanna write here, so actually I'm gonna delete this. This is a better idea, control C. Yeah, we have many more problems now. This is a much smarter, smarter thing to do. All right, so now we have, but in addition to these quantities, we now have A figured out, right? The acceleration. Um, so, or the magnitude of A. Yeah. So that's a number of things. So for part B, we want to find the uh, tension, uh, T1, right? So if we look here at this block, at block 1, all we have to do is sum the forces on block 1, okay? And we can look at that, and we can uh, we have M1G, we sum the forces, 
with the block one. Sum the forces, so that will be, if we look here, that's mg down, and we have tension going up. That's it. Um, so we have uh, T1. Wait, did it ask for A? For what? Oh, what are B, the tension T2, and C, the tension T1? Okay, so I'm going to do it correctly. So here we have for block two, um, we notice uh, we want to be careful. We want to, uh, ah, so why are we starting with block two? Because block two is the one that's falling. So that's the one we know stuff about directly. We still have M, um, MG here, right? Um, so let's take a look. Um, this is M2G, so it's still that's still happening. But I was I was feeling like I was missing something. So there we go. We have our two. So looking at block two first, so we're looking here first. Um, we have T2. Uh, minus M2G. Equals, it's falling up or down. Got to know it's falling down. Minus M2A. Right? It's falling. So hopefully we can see that minus M2A. So solving for T2. That's going to be equal to... Um, Just doing some algebra here because this will all be added, so that'll be G minus A. Okay, and when you plug that in, we know G, we know A, we know M two, right? Those are all those are given. So we know in our givens we also have uh, M one and M two are right here. In case you can't see those. I know it's hard to find values in big paragraph problems like this. So keep in mind that information is there. So you have M2, you have G and A. So this T2 is now just a number. And you will get 4.87. Now you'll notice that the acceleration is pretty small compared to G. Recall that A and that the acceleration in part A is only uh, 6 times 10 to the minus 2. But that's enough to, you know, change it to to add a make a little difference here. Uh, when we find T one, when we do part C, we do it the same way, right? We have sum the forces. T one minus M one. Um, But you'll notice block two is falling, block one must be rising. So that's going to just equal M1A. And when we do this, T1 in this situation is going to be equal to M1 times G plus A. So you'll notice different, you know, different mass here. G plus A. Our tension, our T1, is going to be equal to 4.54 newtons. All right? So you'll notice they're almost the same, but they are different. Okay? Um, so keep that in mind uh, through throughout here. Pretty interesting, huh? So basically, we saw before... In previous problems, when we did Atwood's machines and there was no, you know, nothing here, we could use these as second law forces, the tensions uh, from one to the other. But now, when we have a pulley with mass, we can't really do it. We can't really do that anymore. Okay.
we look at these we have to look at these tensions as as sort of separate beings all right um, okay so let's move on to part D So part D asks, what is the magnitude of the pulley's angular acceleration? Okay, so now we're getting into stuff that seems a little different now, right? So how would we do this? Well, we want to know, let's look, think of the things we have. We have T. We have T and delta Y. We have the acceleration, M1, M2. Are we given R? Yep, we're given R. And we also now have solved for T1 and T2. So we have a lot of stuff we know now. This can almost seem overwhelming. But let's just look at what they're asking. What is the magnitude of the pulley's angular acceleration? So we want alpha, right? And if we remember, I always have to derive these equals theta times r, right? So if we take the time derivative of both sides, where s is a position, We can say that a equals alpha r and then solving for alpha alpha will be equal to a over r this is in general in our particular case here alpha will be equal to the acceleration we found in part a over r all right so now that we've done that with D, we can ask ourselves, well, what is the total rotational or what is the inertial rotational inertia? Okay, so alpha is going to be 1.2 radians per second squared. So let me plug that in. Now let's go down to our last part. So we saw we had all that given stuff before. So it wants to know what is the uh, rotational inertia. So from what we just saw in our previous section, oh dear, we see that the, the torque equal to I times alpha. So we have alpha. We know we want to find I. So is there any way we can look at the torques? Well, remember the net torque is also equal to torque one plus torque two. All right. So when we look at that, when we look at this, we can see that, um, and recall that T equals R F sine phi. And then we have to actually use our right hand rule to determine if they're negative or positive. So if you, uh, if you look here, both forces, T1 is applied here, right? And it's going down. And we have T1 being applied here and it's going up. So we know that phi is 90 in both cases. So we can just worry about T1 equals um, R times T1. So that's one thing we can ask. And now we have to ask ourselves, is this positive or negative? So you'll notice that this force going up with your right hand rule, stick your thumb Put your thumb right on that dot in the center of the circle. Now close your hands and ask, you know, or, or point your, your hands along, or your, your thumb on the circle, and then ask yourself if that force is causing a, uh, a 
clockwise or counterclockwise um, rotation there. Or no, wait a minute. That's that's all incorrect. Um, that's what's actually happening. We're looking at the point applied on the pulley. I'm sorry, I got confused. I knew something was something felt off there. So you look at the force here, right? Let's erase this line. That's okay. Okay, let's look at this again. We're not looking at. So where I got confused, where, where where the confusion comes from is I was used to working with the blocks and I was thinking of the tension is up. The tension is not pulling up on the disc. The tension is in fact, if we look at this point, now we're just looking at the disc, the tension is actually pulling down. And you'll notice that the tension also here is pulling down. Okay? So ask yourselves. Is this is this going to cause is this going to cause this disc to rotate in a clockwise or counterclockwise direction? So this tension pushing down here is going to tend to want this to rotate like this, right? And this is um, I just want to be sure I get the signs and everything right. So we have this one pushing, this looks like it's going counterclockwise, and T2 looks like it wants to push it clockwise. So we'll call that uh, T2 equals R1, we'll do minus. And so if we look here, um, We have the torque is equal to R times T1 minus T2. And then we have, uh, so we have both those values and we can plug them in. And we will also notice here, right, we also have to we also have to ask ourselves about the sign. Uh, if we're falling, we're going clockwise. So we want to put the correct expression here would be that um, we'd have the net torque, right? Because if this is falling, then this is spinning. Um, I'm, I'm doing this like you can see it. <laughs> um, then this would cause this to spin counterclockwise, right? So from there we have minus I alpha equals R times T1, didn't know T2. There's a lot of going on in this problem, minus T1. And there's a lot of bookkeeping you'll notice too. Uh, and so we can do that minus sign we can say that alpha is equal to R times T1 minus T2. And that's going to be over, um, no, we want I, sorry. So it's going to be over alpha. See, there's a lot to keep track of here. And we can get I. All right, that's better than figuring out the whole moment of inertia for the, the whole darn thing. But you'll notice we can get the moment of inertia without having the mass of the um, of the uh, disk given. And if I were to have a part F to this question, um, so the rotational inertia, I don't have enough room to write it down cleanly, but it's going to be uh, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 2 kilograms meters squared. Um, if you... Um, it, a good part F to this question would be, what is the mass of the pulley? Okay. So hopefully that, you know, you can go through this question again. I would rewind it if you want. Uh, there's E parts to this problem. This is a, a, you know, I think I even assigned this one. So hopefully that'll, that'll help you through it. And you can see sort of the structure of how this, a problem like this would work.
Uh, that's it for chapter 10. So we are going to go straight to chapter 11. I was hoping that would be uh, a little more dramatic. Oh, or uh, let's not save the changes there. Um, and we'll go right to chapter 11, which is rolling torque and angular momentum. Now in this chapter, we're gonna get our proper definitions of angular momentum. And we are going to, um, and we're also going to introduce rolling motion. Okay, now, rolling motion is the combination of uh, translational motion and rotational motion. So we're basically looking at rotational motion, which we just looked at in chapter 10, and we're going to combine it with translational motion, and we'll come up with rolling motion. You'll see this explicitly, what the consequences of this are. But you'll notice you have a rotating component and a um, and a translational component here. You can see both of them, and that will in will be very interesting as far as our pictures and things like that go. So of course, like we want to do when we introduce any new type of quantity, we want to discuss its properties and what limitations we'll be looking at in our system. So you'll notice you have a rolling object here. So we consider only objects that roll smoothly. That is, they don't slip, okay? Slippage means that there's a kinetic friction, essentially. Um, the center of mass of the object moves in a straight line parallel to the surface. So we can see that the center of mass here will look like a dot that is just translating, okay? But, and let me get to the review here so I can get my pens back. But it's important to note that you have this rotation going on here as well. So the object rotates around the center of mass as it moves. So that makes that pretty easy. And the rotational motion is defined by S equals theta R, which we're familiar with. So therefore, the, the center of mass will be equal to omega R. Okay? So they are connected and related. Um, now, you'll notice some interesting things about um, rolling without slipping. So you can actually roll on a surface with friction. In fact, friction makes rolling possible. But I want you to compare our pure rotational motion, right? You'll remember if you look at the wheel, right? The wheel is just rotating. It'll have a velocity equal to the center of mass velocity up here. And then you'll notice it goes in the opposite direction down here. And if it's purely translating, right, all three points on the wheel have the same translational uh, velocity. Now, velocity is a vector. And to get rolling motion, I told you it's quite literally, in the last slide, the addition of the, um, it's quite literally the addition of the pure rotational motion and the pure translation motion, okay? So when you, to add them together, you add their vectors together. You'll notice this vector and this vector are the same, so they double. So at the top of the wheel, the V is equal to twice the V at the center of mass. You'll notice here that the rotation, the velocity is zero at the center, right? It's just spinning. Plus V center of mass is just the V center of mass. But here's where things get interesting. Here's where things get really, really fascinating. If you look here, you have negative V center of mass for the rotation and V center of mass, and you get a uh, velocity of zero at the bottom. So remember when I told you that friction would become a little more complicated? We have arrived. And what I mean by that is if you're rolling on a surface with friction, all right, which you have to be, you can't roll on a surface without friction. Think about that. It'll make sense. Um, but your friction is going to not be kinetic friction, but static friction, because your velocity at the point of contact is, in fact, zero. And if you don't believe me, take a look at this picture of a wheel rolling. All right, this is taken from a high-speed photograph. You'll notice how you can see very clearly the spoke as if it has zero velocity, 
and how it's moving in blurry at a much faster velocity up here at the top. All right, you can see the different velocities in the picture of the wheel. All right, generally I would have the, uh, the giant bike wheel, which you would have had some fun with at this point in the lab and roll it and you can actually see this uh, for yourself. But if you look at cars, I don't know if, you ever, if you've ever looked at wheels at cars, but when they roll, it's very counterintuitive. You can actually kind of see this. It looks like, well, wait a minute, it's going so fast at the top and slow at the bottom. It almost looks like it doesn't make sense. But in fact, it does and is explained by rolling motion physics. So let's look at our first checkpoint here, okay? Uh, and we have to be, you, you know, we're getting to the point where we have to read very carefully. Um, so the rear wheel on a clown's bicycle has twice the radius as the front wheel, all right, when the bicycle is moving. Is the linear speed at the very top of the rear wheel greater than, less than, or the same as at the very top of the front wheel? And is the angular speed of the rear wheel greater than or less than the uh, speed of the front wheel? So we want to draw this, and the trick is to keep this straight. So you have the rear wheel is big, the front wheel is small, and you have, you know, some frame here with the clown sitting, moving on the bicycle. It's not the best picture. But in order for everything to be moving, right, if this is at the center of mass is here, if you have the uh, a center of mass of the clown, then at the top of each wheel, you'll have to be moving at 2 VCM. That's what our rolling motion says. So indeed, our, our, um, our linear speed at the top will have to be the same in order for the bicycle to be moving uniformly. Now, the bigger wheel, we know that V is equal to omega R. So on the rear wheel, the angular speed of the rear wheel, is it greater than, less than, or the same as that of the front wheel? Well, here, as, as with everything that's constant, right? If this V is constant, then if R goes down, right, omega has to go up. But in the case of our rear wheel, our R is increasing, going up, so our omega, our angular speed, must actually go down. So we will see in that case that the less than will be correct, all right? So hopefully that makes sense. And we can see here what we get. And we want to move on to forces and kinetic energy of rolling. So you're gonna notice when we do forces and things like and kinetic energy, we're going to be adding uh, our quantities together, all right? So we'll start here with kinetic energy, right? You'll notice that the kinetic energy of rolling motion, much like the picture we saw before, this is the rotational part, I'll put rot, and then this is the plus the translation part. Okay? So we can see that the rolling object will have both types of kinetic energy. Uh, and this actually makes for some very interesting problems and conceptual problems because you have two places to get the energy from. Okay? So rolling, you know, a rolling object has not just its translational energy to draw from, but it's rotational as well. And I want you to think about what that does for frictionless surfaces. We're usually we're usually used to friction, uh, which is non-conservative, as solely something that takes away energy. Um, but if we have a wheel on a frictional surface, it has more energy available to it because it has a rotational component too. Uh, and we'll see that as we go forward. So a force must act to prevent slip. Uh, if the wheel accelerates, its angular speed will change. So. The force that prevents it from slipping is a static frictional force. And now you'll notice this is all looks weird. The wheel is moving this way. As it's rolling, it's going to roll along here, right? And you might be going, well, wait a minute, the static friction should be, should be going the other way. But we're talking about rolling motion here. So we have to be very careful. 
because the point here at zero, slippage, right? Basically, the wheel's moving this way. If it could slip, it would just want to move. It would be pushing this way. There would be a force slipping. You know, if it were kinetic, there'd be this force of slip that would lead to complicated motion. But as long as this velocity is zero and this is static, this doesn't exist, and all we have is the static friction pointing that way. All right? So you'll notice here we have what appears to be the opposite situation. All right? Uh, the FS now seems to be defying our rule where we're rolling down the other way, and now FS is pointing up the ramp. Well, so now we have to expand this idea. We can see it if slip occurs and the motion uh, uh, is not rolling. So if we're smooth rolling down the ramp, we'll notice the gravitational force is vertically down, the normal force is perpendicular, and the force of the friction points up the slope. Wait a minute, what's going on? First, our roll is with the motion, and now it's against it. Basically, what we can see here is that um, we'll have to look at the, the total torque right, the rotational direction, to figure out, um, or the total torque due to the frictional force to determine the angular acceleration of the center of mass, all right? And we'll have to, uh, we'll have to, we'll have to play with that. Picking that frictional point will be uh, a little difficult. All right. So, we can use this equation, which you can. Do, I encourage you to uh, develop and look at yourself. Uh, you can do this by summing the, the uh, forces uh, and um, to find the acceleration, uh, and then you can uh, 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 derive this uh, ex uh, expression for um, a com or the a, the acceleration of the center of mass. And we want to note that the fric frictional force produces the rotation. Okay, so you want to. So basically, you want to look at your rotation, and that will tell you which way your frictional force is going. Okay? So let's see if we can make some sense of that. This is one detail that's, that's going to hang me up, and I know it. So if we look here, we'll... I'm doing this like again, like you can see it in class. Uh, let's erase some stuff. So the wheel is rotating and going, you know, it's going to push here and the friction. So if it's going to slip, saying it wants to slip back, rotating this way. And of course, if we rotate it the other way, it's saying that the force of friction would flip. So. I think when we look at here, uh, I think I think this is a, a classic example of looking at uh, rotation and slipping, um, because here you'll notice that the tendency is not to slip up the ramp, right? It's to slip down the ramp, and when you look at that down the ramp slipping, the slippage direction should be this way, uh, and that'll be due to gravity. Uh, so there's the translational slip and the rotational slip, right? So it's actually gonna depend which one is greater, which way that friction goes. So you have to really be careful in, in that direction in looking at which direction uh, you go. If you're rotating fast enough and you slip, you know, you know you're accelerating uh, up the ramp, um, the, if the slip occurs, you'll rotate just right up that ramp, right? That can happen, but that would not be smooth rolling. That would require you to have some acceleration. In order for smooth rolling to occur, we want to fight slip, which would be in this direction. And then uh, we'd want to, so if we're fighting the slip going down, that means the frictional force has to point back up the ramp in the same direction. So it's not, go, it's not as easy as it was before to pick that direction. We have to consider which way we're rotating and whether we're going up the ramp or down the ramp. All right, so a lot of stuff to think about here. A lot of stuff to keep track of. 
Now, we want to look at two disks A and B are identical and roll across the floor with equal speeds. So that should be easy. We can make two disks. It's not letting me do it. So there's disk A and disk B, right? They're rolling across the floor and then they move up inclines. All right. So disk A rolls up an incline reaching a maximum height of H and disk B moves up an incline that is identical except it is frictionless. Is the maximum height reached by the disk B greater than, less than, or equal to H? Now at first thought, you might think that friction is going to slow, um, is going to slow this down. Um, but with our rolling motion, again, our point of contact there's th two things to look at. One, when you're sliding, your point of contact is the whole thing. There's a whole lot of rubbing going on. Here, there's only one point of contact when you're rolling. So friction is going to play a lot less of a role. Second of all, the velocity for smooth rolling is zero. So one could argue that trans the translational friction is very little, if any at all. You can almost think of it as rolling on a frictionless surface. All right? Um, and you'll notice if you actually look at friction due to rolling, it's very, 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 very low. All right, if you don't believe me, uh, think about pushing an object about a car, about pushing a car and getting it to slide versus getting it to roll. You can't push a car by yourself uh, if the parking brake is on, right? And, it, and it's expecting to slide. However, if you put that sucker in a neutral, you by yourself can get that car moving with very little effort. Um, so, at least as long as you're not going uphill. So, so this is a bit counterintuitive because what's going to happen is we're actually going to find that B's height, capital H for B, will be greater than H. Because as soon as A hits that frictionless part, it's still going to be rotating, but, this, but it'll slide and it'll turn that kinetic energy, right? It'll turn that U, that so let me let me draw this hold on let's look at both both of these so if we look at this right let's look at our two setups so without so the, for the whole thing we start off with K rotational, plus K translational, right? They have two forms of kinetic energy. So in the first one, your final, you end up with K rotational plus U, UG, gravitational potential energy. Only what I mean by that is Nothing is changing as you hit, when you hit this frictionless area, you start sliding. So when you slide, your translational kinetic energy can still go into um, potential energy, but your rotational energy doesn't move, right? You're just spinning. So it'll, it'll, it'll get to a height and spin. Now, if you have friction, right, you can continue to roll up the hill, right? You're not just sliding up the hill. So now, your situation is you have K rotational, I'm going to call this one, plus K translational, and that's going to equal all uh, potential energy. We'll call this UG2. And now you have not only this term, but this term. So we can see here that UG2 is greater than UG1, and UG2 equals M G capital H U G one equals M G H and therefore we see that if you that therefore capital H must be greater than H. Okay. Go through this one again, replay it, do what you gotta do, make it make sense. It's a counterintuitive checkpoint. You'll notice even the answer when they say it.
Um, but remember, basically, I might have mixed up which one was B and call, calling them two and one. Uh, I think I said one was frictionless. But you'll notice disk B moves up the incline that is identical, but it's frictionless, right? So uh, the disk A rolls up an incline, reaching a maximum height of H, and disk B moves up an incline. Um, disk A rolls up an incline, reaching a maximum height of, of H, and disk B is frictionless, so disk B has to be less than A, right? But the point here is... I might have mixed those up, but the answer is correct because B is the one with um, uh, that is identical except it is frictionless. So B's height will be less than H, but for all the same reasons we described before. But you have to be careful here. I just mixed up the subscripts. Uh, but you'll notice when I talked about it, and I want to be clear here, I said the one with friction, the one without friction, right? I, I missed the A and B, and I called the one with friction. Uh, one, I called B disk one in the previous example, and disk A was two. So that will be confusing to you. Uh, but the same thing holds. Okay? So now we can look at some uh, interesting, we can look at the yo-yo and sort of get an idea of how it works. So a yo-yo moves down a string, all right? And it loses potential MGH, but gains rotational and translational uh, kinetic energy. So that's why when you have it go down, it gains, it certainly trans gets some kinetic energy, but it also can rotate, which is why you can do some of those interesting tricks. So you'll find that when you linear acceleration of yo-yo down its string, it rolls down a ramp of 90 degrees. Uh, it rolls on the axle instead of its outer surface, and it's slowed by tension, T, acting here rather than friction. So the tension takes place of the friction, but you'll notice that the problem looks like a um, a a uh, a roll a, a, uh, a disc rolling down a ramp, but the yo-yo is rolling down a ramp of ninety degrees. Okay, and replacing the value for phi equals ninety leads to this reduced equation for the yo-yo. All right, and you can calculate the acceleration of the yo-yo by just plugging all of this stuff in and getting an idea of what it is. All right. And you can see how to do that there. All right, so torque revisited. This is about where I wish to stop because uh, we have the right hand rule coming up. So I just want to introduce that to you. So I want you to practice getting the, um, uh, the direction down with the right hand rule. So with the right hand rule on the screen, put your hand, lay your right hand down on the F vector. And you'll notice you can close your hands to the R vector and that the torque, which will be R cross F, it's given here and will be introduced in the next slide, will point up. All right. So, um, so what we see here is that one, we can generalize torque because we looked at just a rotating body and now we define it for an individual particle that moves along any path relative to a fixed point. You'll notice we don't have to be rotating, but we have to have a fixed point. The torque is still has to be about a fixed point. And this could be just translating this way, but at this point, it will have this torque, R cross F. And again, we want to use that right hand to look at it. Um, so our general equation, we finally get to our equation for our general equation for torque, which you can see here. And you have torque uh, resolved into those perpendicular um, components. This will be your language of moment arms and line of action. All right. So we can look at our checkpoint. This is where I would have you read. We're going to start with this checkpoint tomorrow and re go over torque. Um, so this is where you should be. Uh, I'm. Um, I think for attendance. Um, I'll worry about that later. Uh, but this for, um, this will be, this will be where we'll start and we'll get started on Friday tomorrow as if you've seen this. So I expect you all to watch it, which I'm saying now at the end. Okay. So let me stop the recording.